Hello everyone and welcome to Galileo Exploration, a fast progression series where we explore new planetary body every episode and today we are going to the cursed planet Falia. Why this planet is cursed exactly, we will find out later. But let me assure you that there is something profoundly wrong with Falia. So let's jump right into it. As you can see our rocket has been built already and we are sending a couple of missions in fact to Falia and its moon Eta. What we are sending is a contract satellite that will take scans of magnetosphere from high and low orbit but then we'll reposition it to actually get some information about the biomes and the surface of Falia. Then we'll have a lander that will send to Eta, the one you see in the cargo bay. But the main part of our mission is hidden under the fairing and it's a rover that we will send on the surface of Falia. We will try to collect some data from at least two biomes, maybe look for an anomaly and once this is done, hopefully, uh, hopefully we will uh, detach the landing can from the rover leaving the body of the rover on the surface of Falia and then the lander can will go back into orbit to dock with the mothership. The entire ship is meant to be recovered back on Gale obviously and uh, the first stage of our rocket that you can see departing right now is almost an SSTO rocket. Almost because it won't have enough delta V to get us into a stable orbit but it's meant to be recovered. And also it has no probe core, so we'll have no way of controlling it once it's re-entering the atmosphere. So fingers crossed that it will land safely. Now the only thing that we need to do is uh, a small correction burn to get our apoapsis, no periapsis, out of the atmosphere. And we can lose the fairing as well as you can see because our rocket is already out of the atmosphere. But since I did a terrible job at launching this rocket, we actually had to time warp slightly to get to the apoapsis. And uh, yeah, then we performed our circularization burn. And now we are with our first stage re-entering. And um, as you can see, I attached the heat shields on the wrong side of the rocket, as usual. But uh, you know, we are not really using them as heat shields, we are using them as drogue shoots so that's a no problem. Uh, during our re-entry a couple of temperature gauges popped up but nothing exploded but then we lost a couple of air breaks to a hard splashing but um, yeah I think it's a success even though it, we landed quite far away from the KSC. Now our spacecraft is in orbit and ready to perform its transfer burn to Falia. And to get to Falia we need to spend at least 1400 meters per second for the transfer burn then we will need to spend another 1600 meters per second for the injection and then again 1600 meters per second for the transfer back to Gale. The landing on Falia requires a little bit over 1800 meters per second but our rocket will not be landing on Falia. The landers obviously have enough fuel to, to do it. And uh, this is obviously assuming that we are starting in a zero inclination uh, parking orbit around Gale and Falia is also in a zero inclination orbit which is not the case. And therefore the burns that we will have to perform in reality will be a little bit more especially the insertion burn. And uh, as you can see to save a little bit of fuel uh, we did not launch during a a proper launch window to Falia. We launched at the point where Gale was crossing the descending node on Falia's orbit and um, because of that we will be able to perform a really small transfer burn and then our insertion burn on Falia will be just slightly higher but we will save the fuel that we would need to spend due to uh, the inclination changes and thus we'll have a small overall net gain in delta V spent. Obviously that required a little bit of waiting and uh, corrections to actually get an encounter with Falia but uh, well since we are playing with no life support and our Kerbals are enjoying a um, prolonged stay in space uh, that was not a problem. To actually have an encounter with Falia what I did is I performed a small um, burn at um, periapsis of our solar orbit to ensure that uh, our Falia encounter will occur in a couple of next orbits. And as you can see this burn was indeed very small, a couple of meters per second was sufficient to get an encounter with Falia and then all we needed to do is time warp to actually get a proper encounter a couple of orbits later. After performing a small correction burn that would place our um, periapsis very close to the surface of Falia, the cursed planet, as we will find out really soon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you will see, I'm already excited. We were ready to actually get to Falia, finally. As you can see, our insertion burn was um, just over 1600 meters per second, pretty close to what we have estimated, so very good. And as you can see, now we can uh, admire Falia in her rusty glory, I would say. 
Initially I placed our spacecraft in a relatively eccentric orbit, actually uh, with its apoapsis almost at the edge of Falia's sphere of influence and this was done only because we needed to actually change the inclination of uh, the orbit of our spacecraft and also we wanted to deploy our contract satellite in a different orbit. And uh, as you probably know, changing your orbital inclination is best performed at the lowest orbital velocity that you can possibly achieve and if you can do it it's a good practice to actually ensure that your orbital velocity is the lowest at your ascending or descending node, so you can easily change your orbital inclination without spending too much of delta v. So once we got to our apoapsis, that happened to be at one of the nodes as well, we deployed our contract satellite. As you can see, it's a rather large spacecraft that has um, that is equipped with all of the antennas and uh, large solar panels to ensure that it will have enough power to transmit all the data that we wanted to, and also has a lot of scanners and you know all the science equipment that are resettable and reusable, so we can actually use them multiple times. And uh, <laughs> you can see it has also an antenna overkill because uh, I actually made a mistake and I uh, did not uh, realize that I'm using a, a radial symmetry when uh, placing those um, plasma. Uh, radio antennas and uh, it has many more than it actually needs but uh, well it, <laughs> it looks cool very scientific indeed so the contract required us to take magnetosphere readings from high orbit around uh, Falia and also from low orbit around Falia and also required us to have a inclined orbit with a high eccentricity and what was interesting about this contract is that it stated only the minimum values for uh, eccentricity and uh, inclination so we could also have a polar orbit which is what we want actually for a uh, surface mass mapping of Falia and the biome mapping as well. So after performing all the possible readings from uh, the high orbit around uh, Falia and changing the uh, inclination to actually 90 degrees to have a um, polar orbit around Falia with a high eccentricity, I uh, proceeded at uh, performing a small correction maneuver at periapsis to lower our apoapsis to within the acceptable limits so we can still uh, fit within the contract requirements and uh, our satellite was not placed in an optimal obviously orbit for um, surface scanning but was still acceptable and uh, performed some scans and uh, we needed to keep it there for at least uh, a bit over 200 days and um, once this was done uh, we of course proceeded with taking all the possible science readings that we could uh, and uh, the <laughs> that yielded us some uh, extra science that was very much needed and then we could go to our spacecraft and place it in a correct orbit for landing on Falia which required us to perform a relatively large burn at periapsis to lower our apoapsis to the point where we were in a roughly circular orbit around Falia, obviously still highly inclined, but that was actually intentional, because I wanted to pick a landing spot that would be at the edge of two biomes and, if possible, close to an anomaly if we find one. So Falia as a planet does not look particularly challenging, it has a surface gravity comparable to Duna and has no atmosphere, so there is nothing that indicated that uh, there might be some hidden surprises uh, waiting for us uh, and uh, that could endanger our mission, and um, yes, uh, <laughs> that was in fact the case as you were about to, to see. The reason why Falia is so dangerous is that it has a um, very high ambient temperature uh, which uh, simulates high levels of radiation and what happens actually and what it does uh, is that uh, Falia will heat up your spacecraft and the closer you are to Falia the more heating you will receive so you are safe in a high orbit around Falia but once you get close, things start to overheat really, really quickly. I didn't know the magnitude of this effect and I wasn't really prepared for it as <laughs> you were about to see. And it gets much more intense on the surface. So after just a couple of orbits, we got a very partial and basic map of um, Falia's surface and biome distribution. And look, we also discovered that there is an anomaly which is conveniently placed very close to two biomes. Uh, so I decided that we will land there. So for landing on Falia, I decided decided that uh, the honor uh, should be for uh, Valentina and uh, Bob, because uh, <laughs> Valentina is more, um, let's call it, uh, less reckless than Jeb is, so uh, this mission sh might be a little bit dangerous, so we, we need someone who is uh, responsible. And Bob, well, <laughs> for obvious reasons, he's the only guy that we have who can reset experiments, and since we want to do multiple um, readings from, from different biomes and take multiple samples from uh, different experiments, then 
uh, we need someone to reset them. And um, yeah, so once this was chosen, I detached the rover that also has its proper sky crane that will it will use for landing. Yeah, we proceeded with landing on the surface of Falia for the very first time. Initially, nothing spelled disaster, and I actually started to think that maybe, maybe all those stories about Falia being so dangerous were, um, you know, a bit exaggerated. We actually had a little bit of heating in the orbit, but nothing that was exceptionally scary. And uh, here our rover during landing was not heating at all. So I was thinking, yeah, maybe it's only over certain regions or something like that. So nothing to be very scared about. Uh, the radiator started to heat a little bit, but nothing dangerous. And uh, yes, here we are, touched down on the surface and uh, we've landed on the surface of Falia for the very first time. So now it was the time to detach our sky crane and I, I actually, since it has no prop core, I actually set the thrust to the point where it would um, very gently float away and land nearby and as you can see it landed vertically so uh, yes <laughs> that was a success and then the problem started. As you can see how everything started to overheat almost immediately. Yeah that got me scared a little bit and <laughs> I actually panicked a little, uh, and started taking all the experiments uh, I could very quickly and I was hoping to explore this anomaly before we uh, hit to the point where we will have to leave the planet or uh, I don't know, abort the mission. <laughs> That actually is very scary the first time you land on the surface of Falia. It is scary. And um, the anomaly that we've discovered is obviously an obelisk, very similar to the one we've discovered recently on Duna, but uh, only in the appearance. It does not give you any bonuses. And if you're interested how hot it is on the surface of Falia, I was actually measuring the temperature and it gets to 1200 degrees Kelvin and I didn't want to measure it further. But there is a very simple exploit that you can use to cancel all of this effect. All you need to do is use the on rails time warp and it will cool your spacecraft down. So I must admit that uh, grudgingly I uh, used this exploit to actually cool down my spacecraft because otherwise I would not be able to continue the mission. And now you can call me a dirty cheating alpaca. Uh, well, but the, on the downside and uh, in the defense of myself, I will tell you that uh, your spacecraft will continue to heat up even when the game is paused. So, so yes, so uh, <laughs> this effect is not completely balanced. Um, after we finished studying the obelisk, I decided that we will drive south because using this exploit, we will have extended lifetime on the surface of Falia to actually get some science data from the nearby biome, which would be the abyss. And um, I must say that this rover that I made for this mission was um, is in fact actually uh, one of the most successful rovers that I've made so far. It's very stable, it drives really well and I actually like it. And my plan was to drive it to the point where we would be exactly at the edge of two biomes <laughs> because well uh, during the design phase of this rover I did not pay uh, much attention and it turned out that I uh, accidentally moved the uh, landing can a little bit too close to the um, I think uh, the goo containers or maybe the science junior and now the kerbals cannot leave the uh, the lander can. It's not a big deal because the lander can is uh, designed to detach at the point where we'll be ready to go back into orbit, leaving the body of the rover down on the surface of Falia. But we don't want our kerbals to walk on the surface of Falia for a very long time because they <laughs> might die. And uh, yeah, so we needed to park our rover exactly at the edge of two biomes and then take all the surface samples and EVA reports and then quickly go back to the lander can for safety. Our willing victim for this task was Bob, but first we needed to detach the lander can so he could actually leave it. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, at this point I had no idea whatsoever how long he can stay on the surface, so I started to collecting all the data that we took from the previous biome and then getting the data and the science experiments from the biome that we were currently in, which was the abyss. Then I also decided to take all the uh, science data that we had attached on the lander can on the exterior just in case we had to EVA our way back to the spaceship. And uh, once it was done, Bob just needed to walk over to the second biome, take all the surface uh, samples, and then he could go back to the lander can. Once Bob was safely in the lander can, we could take off into orbit. And um, I must say that uh, this mission to Falia was by far the most exciting mission I actually had in the Galileo's plant pack. It is difficult and it is challenging and uh, if I did not resort to exploits, I must say, unfortunately, unfortunately, I must admit that they did resort to exploits, I don't know if we could actually land our spacecraft on Falia. I highly doubt it. I think it would be a disaster. But hey, 
<laughs> well, whatever works, right? So, as you can see, uh, we would get into orbit that would be even more inclined than the orbit that uh, we left our transfer rocket in, and that was a potential small problem, because we had enough delta V in the lander to get into orbit, but not enough to actually get a rendezvous with our transfer rocket but uh, well we could use our rocket and we will use our rocket to get a rendezvous with the Lanzacan but it will place us in an even more inclined orbit than we initially were so yeah that was a potential issue but once our Kerbals were uh, safely in orbit far away from Folia deadly radiation or at least the far enough <laughs> so they could actually survive longer. We uh, proceeded with setting a maneuver node to actually get an encounter with our transfer rocket and that required some, some gymnastics and some careful planning. Nothing too exciting but uh, well we had enough Delta V in both our spacecraft to actually ensure that we would um, have a rendezvous and uh, dock inside a cargo bay because we also had a lot of monopropellant uh, left in the uh, our lander can to actually be able to dock inside the cargo bay and uh, yeah that was a pretty standard maneuver and I won't bore you with uh, all the details about it. The only interesting thing that happened is that uh, <laughs> our ETA lander started to overheat inside the cargo bay so Falia did not want us to leave it without any problems and uh, I actually was a little bit worried that uh, before I dock it because well when you're docking to spacecraft it's uh, not such a good idea to use uh, on rails time warp because they would float away and you you will have to repeat encounter and uh, I actually had to dock them relatively quickly but eventually it uh, all turned out well and once uh, our Lanzacan with our brave carbonates was inside the, the cargo bay we were safe <laughs> in a sense, because we could use again our exploits and uh, or get into higher orbit without using exploits and um, far enough from Falia's deadly radiation that uh, would not um, damage our spacecraft anymore. Uh, we will land on ETA in the next episode and uh, this is all for today, so thank you very much for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed. If you enjoyed, please consider liking this video. My name is Mark Frim and I will see you next time.